Uh, war is defined in which on both sides a thousand soldiers fight and a hundred people, I'm sorry, a hundred people, uh, there's a hundred or a thousand, I think it's a thousand people fight on each side. Um, and it has to be on a battlefield. So the United States overthrew about 15 democracies during and after the Cold War. If you take Aristide in Haiti, he's been elected twice, and Bush one and Bush three kick him out. Bush three organized a coup against Chavez in Venezuela. Chavez is a democratically elected president. U.S. organized a coup against Arbenz in Guatemala in 1953, against Mossadegh in Iran. In 1954, against Goulart in Brazil in 1964. There are about 15 of them. We don't just arm people to the teeth. About non white democracies, we have overthrown, organized the covert overthrow of the government, helped social forces who wanted to murder democratic leaders and establish the most vicious dictators in power. Pinochet in Cuba, I'm sorry, in Chile and the murder of Allende, that's made in America. They're cute, they're Chilean forces that we have the influence to do this, but it is sheerly inimical to democracy. Hey, is it all right to overthrow all these non-white democracies and then to purport that democracies aren't belligerent toward one another? Now, this thesis borders on bad faith and to claim that it's scientific, just on the face of it, is a little bit of a problem. Second problem, World War I is a paradigm for this. The democracies of the time didn't have women suffer, stuff like that. Not very broad, you know. America, incredibly racist, fought against Germany. The high <coughs> German, the Kaiser, bad. Absolutist, right? Biggest elections in the world with most working class suffrage were in Europe. In Deutschland, Social Democrats grew from 1890 to 1914. One of the big tragedies of the socialist movement is that they supported Prussia for the most part, except Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht and some other people got murdered in an uprising in 1919, 1914. They said, we're internationals. We don't believe in the Prussian war effort. They had multiple parties, more than two parties. They had, oh, I don't know, 50% of the adult population voting. And they had 90% of that voting, including a big working class vote. Why aren't they a democracy on this field? Well, they're not because the Kaiser got to appoint the prime minister. So you didn't elect the president. Well, I know you don't get to elect the president there. But on the other hand, the president that we elect seems to make a lot of wars that Americans don't like. The majority of the American people opposed Vietnam by 1968, and the U.S. didn't get out until 1975. Why was that? I understand 49% of the population thinks the U.S. ought to get out of Afghanistan. You think they're going to get out soon? How many people are against the war in Iraq? Barack thinks it's a dumb war. He wants to de-escalate. How many troops came home so far? We got more troops there than we did under Bush. They were still rotating, but we ain't withdrawn them yet. How many people there oppose the U.S. presence? Oh, 90% of the Shia and 77% of the Sunnis. I'm sorry, it's reverse. 90% of the Sunnis and 77% of the Shia. Won us out. How come we're still there? These are on our opinion polls. We pay for them and so on. So, I'd be careful when I said, hey, the democracy with the Kaiser, I'm sorry, you know, the Kaiser appointing the ruler, really is so superior to the American democracy with regard to the control of the people of the president. I mean, you might ask substantively, is it really true that the Kaiser was more anti-democratic than Lyndon B. Johnson? And you might have trouble making that case. Or Lyndon B. Johnson and Richard Nixon. You might have trouble. But they need this case to be anti-democratic because the Kaiser, if the Kaiser represents a democracy, then democracies do go to war with one another. Woodrow Wilson, who was president of the American Political Science Association, he was the sixth president, 
he really was an admirer of Aryan democracy, the kind they have in England and the US, and particularly Deutschland. He was a stone racist who liked the Ku Klux Klan. He also had some good ideas about democracy. But let's subtract for a minute that he's a stone racist, which I have trouble from doing because I don't like racists. But if I abstract for a minute, it seems like on political science definitions, his view and the view of political scientists at the time that Germany was a constitutional regime and was a kind of democracy with a great civil service and admirable from the US point of view, is at least as intelligent as the current bullshit to the effect that Germany is the Hun, which he started saying in World War I, we've got to fight to make a war to make the world safe for democracy, and we've got to fight Germany, so Germany's bad, and Germany's an autocracy. So this, too, is a big problem for the so-called democratic peace hypothesis. But just quickly, the uh, offshoot of this view is a view by a guy named David Lake that when democracy fights against bad guys, all the other regimes are bad guys, they're all absolutists. When democracies fight against bad guys, democracies win four out of five times. So he gives 30 examples which do not much prove his thesis because in better than half of them, the democracies are bad guys. For example, I live in Colorado in a place that was stolen from Mexico in the U.S. aggression against Mexico of 1846-1848, which we've got the two biggest states, Texas and California. But he lists this act of aggression as a victory for a democracy against an absolutist regime. It's one of his 30 cases. Another great case he has is he has many democracies who are listed as um, fighting against the nasty North Vietnamese absolutists on behalf of the government of South Vietnam. And he lists that as a war of democracy against absolutism. So if you were to look at the American and British aggression in Iraq, it would turn out Saddam is a nasty fellow. He is a nasty fellow. That that's counted as a great democratic war to prove the muscle of the United States, except, of course, that we're not doing very well there, in case you haven't noticed. And if you look at Afghanistan, it turns out it's another great democratic war. Well, many of us were sympathetic to the Vietnamese peasant movement against French colonialism, Japanese imperialism, and eventually against American domination. And we thought it was a kind of democratic movement, at least in the sense that it was the peasants who made land reform who do it. This guy, he just says, America, democracy, good, Vietnamese, absolutist, bad. About half his cases are like this. So if we take the democratic peace hypothesis, it doesn't turn out that it's very democratic. I mean, it doesn't seem that democracies are peaceful toward non-white democracies. It doesn't seem that democracies are peaceful toward one another in World War I. And it seems that the belligerence of democracy half the time for colonialist purposes is not very admirable. But if I were to say that to them, they'd say, listen, we're just being value-free here. Right? We're just doing our scientific stuff, and we're just being value-free. 